commissioning uh, radio telescopes in Australia uh, and then partly involved, uh, main, largely involved in commissioning this telescope as well. Uh, Meerkat, which is in South Africa, uh, and has now moved back to the University of Oxford again. So he's sort of headed south and then he's returned north again, back to his roots. Um, so uh, so he's going to tell, it's a really great story, I think, that we're going to hear from Ian tonight about this uh, this amazing new radio telescope array in South Africa called Meerkat. So let's welcome Ian. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Excellent, thanks. Uh, if that stops being the case, please just shout. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for coming. Um, my name's Ian. Thanks, Tim, for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, I haven't been to Jodrell Bank for about 15 years, so it's been an absolute pleasure to return and see all the changes and uh, some of the familiar things that haven't changed. Um, <coughs> this is my email address. Uh, my interaction with you doesn't end this evening. If you think of something tomorrow that you wanted to ask about my talk, please do just drop me a line. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to talk about this stuff at any point with, with any of you. Um, so if you, if you read the little paragraph that accompanies uh, the advert for tonight's talk, you will have seen that it basically only had two things in it. Uh, it had Meerkat, which is a radio telescope, and a uh, mention of this, the centre of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, which I hope you'll be convinced by the end is a, is a somewhat wild place. Uh, if you didn't read the paragraph that accompanied the talk and just read the title, and you were expecting me to talk about the other kind of Meerkat, <laughs> Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I admire your bravado, uh, <laughs> and I hope you'll enjoy what's to follow nonetheless. <clears throat> so I've given a few talks about Meerkat, and often they are to people who might not be too familiar with radio astronomy, or perhaps um, grad students who are new to radio astronomy. And one of the points I always like to stress about Meerkat is that, like, I'm going to show lots of nice images from this telescope later in the talk, but one of the important things I try to impress on people when I give this talk, or a talk similar to this one, is that it hasn't always been this way. Um, this telescope is really something special and it's, uh, it's been the result of the hard work of lots and lots of many clever and talented people, too, too numerous to mention. Um, so I present this talk tonight on behalf of the whole team that has developed Meerkat, uh, although I do stress that any errors are, are mine and mine alone. Um, and I suppose the easiest way to point out that it hasn't always been this way is to go back to the beginning, um, and that is basically the beginning of radio astronomy. Uh, and that's a story in which the Galactic Center features quite heavily. So radio astronomy isn't the newest branch of, of astrophysics or of astronomy. That, that title probably belongs to gravitational waves astronomy. Um, but it is reasonably new. I mean, it's, uh, it's less than 100 years old. Radio astronomy was born basically back in 1933 um, when this chap, Carl Jansky, who was working for, for Bell Labs in, in New Jersey in the USA, uh, constructed this thing here, the merry-go-round. Um, these are basically just antennas hanging off this wooden structure. There's a circular track under here. These are the wheels off a Model T Ford. Um, and what Jansky was up to was that he was attempting to discover sources of interference that were kind of present in, in transatlantic um, wireless communication. <clears throat> so in the course of this investigation, he detected a bunch of things. He detected thunderstorms, radio emission from thunderstorms. He detected radio emission from the sun. But he also detected this mysterious hiss that kind of repeated as he, as he turned the antenna and, and made observations over the course of, of the days and the months, um, which kept reappearing on a 23-hour, 56-minute minute time scale. So this many of you may recognize as the sidereal time, so the Earth rotates with respect to the Sun every 24 hours, but because of the orbit around the Sun, it, res it rotates with respect to the fixed background of stars 23 hours and 56 minutes. Um, and the source of this mysterious hiss turned out to be in the direction of uh, the constellation of Sagittarius, in the direction of the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, so Jansky gets plenty of airtime as kind of the first radio astronomer, the first uh, person who, who discovered radio emission from something in space other than the sun. Uh, and, and in 1933, he published this paper, which has a frankly terrifying title, um, Extraterrestrial Disturbances Apparently of, extra, sorry, Electrical Disturbances Apparently of Extraterrestrial Origin, would have given me the heebie-jeebies at the time. Um, but he gives basically a position for where this mysterious signal is coming from, with a right ascension and a declination. And then I think he kind of went back to, uh, you know, figuring out what was going on with, with communication in, in his business at Bell Labs. So um, although every time we basically quote the brightness of something in space in radio astronomy, we use the unit, the Jansky, um, I think we can, we can attribute the, the kind of the ballooning of radio astronomy as, as an astrophysical discipline and as, and as an observing technique uh, to someone else, which is uh, Grote Reber. So uh, if you've ever heard the expression, you know, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, this guy is my favorite example of this. Because 
this, this man really cottoned on to the idea that Jansky had discovered something that was both interesting and fundamentally of scientific importance. Um, and this was in the middle of the Great Depression in the USA in, in, in the 30s. And he wanted to follow this up, and he tried to get jobs, you know, working at Bell Labs, and no one was hiring. So, you know, even though life gave him lemons, he made lemonade. He basically took matters into his own hands and built this nine-meter parabolic antenna in his backyard uh, to follow this stuff up. So Jansky may have essentially kick-started radio astronomy as a discipline, but I think this chap is probably the first, the very first radio astronomer, um, and that's probably something he held as the only radio astronomer in the world for about a decade. So not only did he confirm Jansky's result at 160 megahertz, um, he also made multi-frequency maps of the Milky Way of our own galaxy. Uh, he found strong radio emission from supernova remnants associated with uh, Cassiopeia A, uh, and he discovered the radio, the radio star Cygnus A, um, something we now know to be a very powerful um, active galactic nucleus, uh, the nearest uh, powerful active galactic nucleus to us in the world, in the universe, I should say. Um, the, dis the discovery of Cygnus A is a, another talk in itself. Um, if you're curious, I urge you to, to go and have a look at it. It's a fascinating story. <coughs> so um, on Jansky's discovery, uh, Reba said this. He said, the astronomers of the time didn't know anything about radio or electronics, and the radio engineers didn't know anything about astronomy. So I think that was true. You know, the Jansky's lab wasn't really interested in the astronomy side of things, and astronomers weren't really interested in um, the radio side of things either, you know, doing, doing actual astrophysics with a bunch of wires stuck between sticks in a field. Um, he actually had a hard time publishing his results because the, the calculations that people were doing based on what they knew to be emitting uh, kind of electromagnetic radiation in space didn't really tally with what, this, but what they were seeing in the radio. And it wasn't really until the, the, the physics of synchrotron radio emission or synchrotron emission was fully developed and realized in later in the 50s that, that people realized that, um, <coughs> that radio astronomy was, was really kind of you know, something that was to, to, be a, to be a very useful tool. In case you weren't convinced that this, this person is the real deal, this is a, a photo of him taken in Tasmania in 1985. So he completed in 1962 something with a collecting area of about 0.97 square kilometers. If you've heard of the Square Kilometer Array Project, that might mean something. Um, for the aficionados of radio astronomy, he was observing at a frequency of 2 megahertz, which is you know, somewhere between very, very gutsy and very, very foolish. The reason he actually went to Tasmania was because, uh, because it was the most favorable part of, of the surface of the Earth where the ionosphere wouldn't be so problematic. <coughs> but here's Reba's map from, from 1944. Um, and you can see these contour maps are just basically lines of constant brightness of radio emission from the sky. He'd painstakingly map these things out with his 9-meter telescope by tilting it and then letting the sky rotate overhead, tilting it, making these measurements. Here's Jansky's best guess at where the source of these uh, radio emissions was from. And here's the peak of, of Reba's map, slightly offset. Um, Jansky also discovered the joys of the ionosphere, which he, he mentioned in the, in the abstract of that paper. Um, but what you see here is essentially uh, the radio emission mapped out from, from the plane of our own galaxy, from the, from the plane of the Milky Way. <coughs> so I said Reba really kick-started radio astronomy as a science, and that's true. I think his, his results on not only our own galaxy, but also things like Cassiopeia A uh, and, and Cygnus A and all of these other things that were real mysteries at the time, kind of kick-started the post-World War II boom uh, in, in radio astronomy as a discipline. So here's a photo from 1945 of uh, some field nearby where we're sitting now. Uh, the first day at Jodrell Bank, apparently, when uh, radio, uh, radio radar equipment was brought down here and, and repurposed after World War II in order to investig investigate these uh, radio signals of celestial origin. It's changed a bit in the intervening years. Um, here's an aerial photograph of, well, last year, I think. So where are we? We're behind the, we're behind the Lovell telescope somewhere. Uh, here's the new SKA building. The lovely Mark II. Uh, myself and at least two of our audience members did our PhDs over here in the missing link room. Yeah. So, you know, from, from those humble beginnings where it was people working on, you know, homemade instruments to kind of very large pieces of scientific infrastructure like this that we that we're dealing with today, uh, and even the headquarters of the organisation that's building the next generation. It's it's right here, right here where we are tonight. So you know the uh, the quality of the images that people were making of space in radio kind of you know con continued to improve. So here's uh, here's Reba's original map, or at least one part of it, and then this little box here shows you the sort of state of the art 30 years later. Um, this is a single dish map of the centre of our own galaxy. Uh, here's our new refined picture of the peak, and you can see that these things are starting to have names now: Sagittarius A, Sagittarius B2, uh, revealing kind of lots of structure. 
um, in, in the centre of the galaxy um, <coughs> by virtue of using essentially, essentially newer and, and better instrumentation. And that's kind of the, you know, the position that, that we're in today. We're using newer and better instrumentation to push our understanding of the universe. So I'll back up a bit at this point. Uh, these contour maps are somewhat, somewhat abstract. You know, they're, they're, they're pretty dry fundamentally. So um, I'll take a moment to kind of put into context kind of what we're, what we're looking at here. So you can see from the stripe, you know, the, the kind of banding of the emission uh, in, in these directions that we're probably looking at something that's thin across the sky. Uh, and of course, that's true of the very familiar optical picture that we get of the sky when we make an all-sky image. Um, so this is the amalgamated measurements from many, many stars from the Gaia satellite. Um, you can see the plane of our own galaxy here. Uh, you can see the dust uh, that blocks, blocks the optical light in the, in the plane of the galaxy. You can see our own neighboring dwarf galaxies here, the large and small Magellanic clouds. By looking at this picture, you can probably infer that our galaxy is disc-shaped, right? We know we're in it and we're looking out. It's kind of hard to you know, take a spaceship and go and have a good look at what's going on. So this is kind of how we, how we make sense of where we are in the universe is through, uh, through observations such as this. Um, <coughs> so one of the ways that I've really enjoyed, or one of the ways that I've enjoyed seeing recently where people have tried to map out the structure of our own galaxy is, is this. So we, we've just seen from this picture that we probably live in a disk galaxy. Of course, we know these days that we live in a disk galaxy that has spiral arms. Um, how do we tell that we live in a galaxy that has spiral arms from a picture like this? And it's the fundamental tricky thing in astronomy has always been the measurement of distance. Um, but you, you can use certain things in the sky to infer distance and therefore structure of our galaxy. And this is one such example. Um, so these dots here are measurements of something called Cepheid variables. Uh, these are one of those kind of almost miraculous things that nature throws our way as scientists. That's, you know, uh, extre extremely good fortune that these things behave the way they do, that nature behaves the way it does. Um, and what these things do is they're, they're stars that pulsate. And how fast they pulsate is directly connected to how actually bright they are. So if you know how actually bright something is and you measure how apparently bright it is, you can turn that into a distance, this so-called standard candle thing. So here's our sun. Uh, these measurements are all measurements of these Cepheid variables. And you can see from this picture that you know, we did know it was a disk-shaped galaxy. Now we know that it's got spiral arms. Uh, but the other thing that I really liked about this data was um, you can actually make a three-dimensional volume. You can measure these things out in a three-dimensional volume. And now we know that we're in a disk galaxy that's got spiral arms that also exhibits a warp. <coughs> we also know from these disk measurements that this thing's probably, you know, 60,000 light years radius or so, and that our galactic center is probably 25, 26,000 light years away. <coughs> so zooming in on the center of the galaxy itself, which uh, is a large part of, of what I'll be talking about tonight, um, here's another one of my absolutely favorite recent results. And this is the result of a very long campaign where people have been using... Um, I think two micron infrared measurements to, to penetrate that dust in the center of the galaxy and actually map individual stars, the motions of individual stars over about a 25 year period um, as they orbit the center of the Milky Way. And you can see from the movie that, you know, as far as these data are concerned, there's not much shining bright in the middle here, but you can also see that these things are whipping around at a feral clip in these various orbits. Um, and this is basically strong indirect evidence. It's indirect because we can't actually see what this thing is, but it's strong indirect evidence for something very big and very dark at the center of the, Mil at the, center of the Milky Way. Uh, so the notion here is that our own galaxy, which is disc-shaped, spiral arms, warped, uh, about 60,000 light years of radius, uh, also has at the center of it basically uh, a, a, a supermassive black hole that weighs as much as 4 million of our suns. <coughs> so I think this is really a really nice data set. Um, the 25 years of orbit orbital mon monitoring covers two complete orbits of, uh, I think it's this one, Yep, there it goes, this one, this star S2. Uh, and these two complete orbits alone let you get very good constraints on the mass of this black hole. Um, but you can, you can also have a look at what this star's doing and you know, the, you can clock it with your speed gun, as it were. And uh, this star approaches whatever this mysterious four million solar mass object is at the, black, uh, the center of the black hole uh, within, a, within a distance of 120 astronomical, uni uh, astronomical units. Uh, and it hits a highest recorded speed of about 2.55% the speed of light. So to put that into context, if you replace the sun with something that weighed 4 million times the mass of the sun, uh, this thing would come in at about 4,500 miles per second at about uh, four times the orbit of Neptune distance. So that's really terrifying. Can you imagine being in that orbit? <coughs> if 
Further evidence comes in things like this. This is near infrared flaring of uh, this mysterious position at the center of the center of the Milky Way that obviously contains something very massive, something very mysterious. Uh, that's the star S2 there. Um, and this is recent monitoring with a very large telescope in South America, I believe, Keck, uh, which showed this thing brightening uh, by a factor of 75 over about a two-hour period. Sorry, it faded by a factor of 75 over a, over a two-hour period. It may have been brighter than this at the beginning. This was just when they caught this and started observing. Um, but if something in that kind of volume is varying with that kind of intensity over that kind of time scale, that tells you two things. It tells you it's probably quite a large and energetic phenomenon, but confined into quite a small region of space. Uh, this infrared variability also correlates with X-rays, so X-rays, very high energy particles that come out of this, um, all kind of supporting the picture that what we have here is a, a supermassive black hole surrounded by an, a, a region of extreme energy, possibly a, an, an accretion disk as matter falls into it, forming a disk around the black hole. And the inference from these measurements is that um, either there's a sudden change in the magnetic environment around the black hole, or there's a sudden change in the accretion activity. That is to say, more stuff is falling in and going boom. <coughs> So I think radio observations of this region, um, aside from the ones I just showed you, uh, really came into, into their own when radio interferometry started uh, uh, being a, a mainstream technique. So interferometry uh, has always been essentially the quest for high angular resolution. Um, so if you have something like the Lovell telescope that you're all familiar with and, and we all love, um, at a frequency of maybe one, one and a half gigahertz, this thing might give you an angular resolution of about 10 minutes of arc on the sky. Whereas if you have an interferometer like this one, this is the Very Large Array in New Mexico, uh, you are able to achieve much higher angular resolution by essentially splitting up the connect collecting area and distributing it out over, over, over a larger distance. So the angular resolution of a telescope like this, or even an optical telescope that consists of a giant mirror, is basically you know, for a given observing frequency or wavelength dependent on the size of the dish. And one of the advantages you have in radio astronomy is that while well, you can break up that collecting area, and all this thing is doing is bouncing signals off the dish here and then gathering them in phase at the receiver here. And one of the nice advantages you can do with radio is you can say, right, well, as long as I'm bouncing off signals off this dish and recording them here, I can make sure that I do all of that in-phase combination after the fact just by getting my cable lengths correct, doing some signal processing that involves delays. Um, and you can essentially get very high angular resolution images by distributing that collecting area over, over a larger region. In fact, interferometry gives you the highest angular resolution in, in all of astronomy. Here's a, here's a Hubble Space Telescope picture of a, a gravitational lens. So what's happening here is there's a foreground galaxy that happens to be perfectly aligned with the background galaxy. Uh, the mass of the foreground galaxy distorts space-time, and the light from the background galaxy gets lensed by that distortion in space-time and produces these, uh, these ring-like structures. So here's the same object observed with Hubble, uh, and then again with global VLBI. Um, I suspect that if you put our lecture theater on the moon and then observed with this kind of resolution, you'd, you'd certainly be able to probably tell you that I was using two TVs in here. This is extremely high angular resolution stuff. And you can see here in, in radio light the, the distorted light from the, from, from the background galaxy. <coughs> so when you see an interferometer, it's, uh, it's kind of tempting to think of you know, each of these receptors lying out on the ground in the same way that you think of pixels in the CCD in an optical telescope or in your telephone camera or any other kind of optical imaging device. Um, but there are some subtleties. You know, the, uh, there are some trade-offs for getting this very high angular resolution. And that comes in the form of essentially the processing that's involved. And then some limitations on the imaging um, that come from the fact that you've split up your collecting area and you no longer have this filled aperture that something like the Lovell has or the big mirror of an eight meter telescope has. So the, although each of these telescopes does make a measurement, the fundamental measurement from an interferometer is actually a, a pairwise cross-correlation of two of these things. So the, the fundamental number that this machine spits out is a multiplication of the signal from this one and this one. And then it also spits out a signal multiplication from this one and this one and this one and this one, and all of the other pairs of telescopes in the, ray, in the array. So every time the, the computer clock ticks in the telescope, the telescope dumps um, a measurement for every single pair of antennas. So antennas that are close to each other like this tell us something about the large-scale structures on the sky, and antennas that are farther away from each other like these two tell us something about the small scale structures on the sky. So from an array like this, we obviously have you know, this pair, which tells us about fine things, you know, slightly less fine things, slightly less fine things, slightly larger things. Um, we use the rotation of the Earth to change the orientation of these pairs of antennas on the sky. Um, we basically build lots and lots and lots of dishes, which gets, gets us lots more pairs. 
And basically what these machines do is they build up lots of information about all of the different scales and of, of emission on the sky uh, insofar as you are able to by building lots of telescopes and using Earth rotation. The fundamental limitation is that you are not sensitive to any emission which doesn't correspond to a, a pairwise correlation of, of these telescopes, i.e. You know, their the, the separation. <coughs> so back to the galactic centre. Um, we have here a nice contour map of a, of, um, a single disk observation of our galactic plane. Um, so here's a kind of early interferometry image of the, of the galactic center taken with, taken with this very telescope here, the Very Large Array. This thing has three arms. This is just one that I'm showing here. It does have uh, other, other arms in the array. Um, and what you can see here is a, a zoom of this region. So this bright splotch here. This is essentially where uh, the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy lives. Uh, it's saturated in this picture. I'll show you some pictures later that show it a little better. Um, but one of the real mysteries that emerged when people first started doing interferometry on the galactic center and being able to look at these fine detailed structures by virtue of this, this observing technique um, was these things, these kind of narrow filamentary structures. So these aren't really seen anywhere else um, in the galaxy other than, other than at the center. Uh, here's a slightly higher resolution, more recent view made with, with that same telescope. And you can see these things, they're like, uh, you know, extremely narrow, extremely narrow structures. We don't really see anything like this in radio other than at the galactic center. <coughs> You've got this almost cirrus-like structure over here. Um, but these, uh, these thread-like uh, filaments have, have basically remained a bit of a mystery since their discovery about, about 35 years ago. Uh, there's lots of theories for their origin. So these things basically emit in the synchrotron radiation uh, that I mentioned earlier in the talk. So synchrotron radiation is when you have a magnetic field and something injects loads of charged particles, typically electrons, at close to the speed of light. They get bound to the magnetic field, accelerate, and, uh, and emit this radiation. But these things are a little mysterious, mainly because of, of how they look. You know, they're very long and they're very narrow. And how you can get, if these things are generated, for example, um, around a star, how you can get something that's so well collimated over such a long distance is, is, uh, is a bit of a mystery. Other theories include that these things are actually representing the kind of the in situ magnetic field of our own galaxy. So the center of our galaxy just has fundamentally this very large magnetic field. And then things go boom in the middle, they inject these particles, and then these, these filaments light up. But still no real clear-cut kind of explanation for, for the origin of these things. Um, <coughs> this is a slightly wider area view of the galactic center now, so uh, you can see again from the, the contour maps I was showing earlier, we've got this nice familiar diagonal structure, which is the plane of our galaxy. Um, as opposed to the optical map I showed you now, this is in equatorial right ascension declination coordinates, not, not galactic coordinates. Um, this to me remains one of the most iconic radio images I've ever seen, so this is, this is 20 years old now. Um, so this was made with the VLA at a frequency of 330 megahertz. Um, it's actually an extremely tricky part of space to observe with an interferometer. So the issues come in when you're doing interferometry because of those things I said earlier, where you are not sensitive to structures on scales that your instrument doesn't see. Um, these kind of, well, you probably see them on the side monitors a little better, but these kind of dark regions are essentially imaging artifacts that come from the fact that this part of space has very strong emission on lots of scales, and your interferometer is only picking up some of them. So I remember seeing this in, in, in 2000 at the time, or slightly after, and actually thinking, wow, because it's, it's a, a very tricky observation, and I remember looking at this and thinking it was, it was actually like nothing else I'd ever seen. So <coughs> we're starting to see some some more detail now in the, in the radio emission around the center of our galaxy and starting to see some features. These threads are what I was talking about earlier, the, the synchrotron filaments. You can also see these shell-like structures here. These are radio emission from supernova remnants, um, little things called the mouse. I'll come back to this one in a bit. Uh, Sagittarius B2 and B1, uh, I think those are star-forming regions. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then you have Sagittarius A, which again is where this supermassive black hole in the, in the center of our galaxy lives. We can zoom in on that region by using uh, uh, different observations. So we've moved from 330 megahertz now to uh, 1.4 gigahertz, so naturally our resolution has gone up. The nice thing about the, the VLA that I've been talking about earlier is that those antennas are actually movable. So it, it's, on a, it's on three Y-shaped, or three, three linear tracks in a Y-shape. This giant machine comes along every once in a while and picks up all the antennas and moves them somewhere else. So this thing operates like a giant radio zoom lens, and if you stretch it right out into its highest configurations, its most extended configurations, you can get these really nice high angular resolution views of the radio universe. Um, and this is precisely what we have here as we zoom in. So going up in frequency and going up in configuration, we start to see inside the heart of our own galaxy in radio light with some really nice detail. 
So this very bright spot here, um, that's, the, that's the precise position of where those stars were whipping around at high speed that I showed you earlier. Very strong radio emission, point-like radio emission from the supermassive black hole in the middle of our galaxy. And you can see that the neighborhood's actually quite a crazy place as well. You know, you've got this, this spiral-like structure as material's falling in. These kind of balloon-like structures as material is blown back out. It's a really fascinating place to study. And using radio is one of the best ways that you can do it. So the radio waves completely penetrate all of that dust that you could see in the, in the optical map that I showed you at the beginning. Interferometry gives us the capability of looking in very fine detail at these radio wavelengths and actually probing the physics of, what, of what's going on in our, in our own home. <coughs> uh, so I gave you a, a little primer on interferometry. Um, Meerkat is a radio interferometer. Um, Meerkat's the South African precursor instrument to uh, the square kilometer array. Uh, it's, it's located in, in South Africa, Meerkat, although the SKA will eventually, I guess, spread to other Southern African countries. Um, and this map here tells you why the location of Meerkat was essentially chosen and why it's a good location to put a radio telescope. Um, you've all switched your mobile phones off, right? So this is population density. Uh, so you've got Johannesburg, Durban, uh, Port Elizabeth, Cape Town, and then where the telescope is, uh, it's pretty sparsely populated. So the issue with radio telescopes is, of course, you, you don't need to just get away from cities where there's light pollution. You have to get away from people where there's mobile phones. Um, even things like the electrical ignition on a petrol engine with a spark plug will generate a spark of radio emission that can actually you know, make itself very, very strongly known in a radio observation. Um, so Meerkat's basically here in the future, future home of the uh, SKA's dish component in, in Southern Africa. And of course, getting away from people means that you're getting away from basically everything. You know, it's, a, it's, it's quite, a, quite a feat to build a large engineering project in a, in a location such as this. This is an aerial view of the site um, prior to any construction, I think, or, or mostly prior to any construction. So it's essentially desert-like. Um, you've got these things which I think the locals call copies. These are like very flat-topped hills. And then you've got you know, a few farms lying around here and there. But basically, uh, the ideal location for a radio telescope, pro probably not the ideal location if you want to build anything easily. Um, but it's been a really quite audacious feat of construction and engineering to get this telescope going. Um, I'll give you a little insight into the kind of industrial underbelly that's behind every modern radio observatory. Um, you can see like a lot of construction that's, that's, that's gone on just to facilitate the telescope, uh, essentially. So the whole thing was mostly constructed on site in terms of the antennas. Um, you've got this big long shed here which is where you know, bits of steel come in this end and antennas come out that end. You can see the construction of this thing going on for one of the antennas here. So there's a, a kind of steel backing frame. Um, then these panels are manufactured to the required tolerances and kind of installed on this frame. Uh, you want to obey the speed limit when you're driving this thing, I think. This is one of the, one of the dishes being wheeled out, um, out to the, the core of the array, at which point it's kind of lifted up and plonked on these pedestals. These things are made in Johannesburg, I think, rather than on site, but they're, again, stuck in sections on the back of things that look like that and, and driven in there. And this is really remote and really, you know, it's, it's a heck of an achievement. They actually had to design uh, a new kind of wooden electricity pole, which didn't spark because the whole site is, uh, is protected by a kind of legislated RFI-free zone, which meets very stringent requirements um, in terms of know, how to what level people are allowed to generate artificial radio signals. And they realized that, you know, the, tra the transformer poles and the electricity poles wouldn't meet the spec. So there was all kinds of, you know, very, very innovative design that, that went into this on the most fundamental level that, you know, I never really thought of until someone pointed it out to me. It's, it's, it's really quite something. <coughs> yeah, so this is one of those manufa dishes manufactured on site being lowered onto the pedestal. Anyone see anything wrong with this picture? Sky's not blue. Very unusual. <laughs> this part I really like. So uh, this is what's called the Karoo Array Processor Building. So this is off to one side. Uh, and this thing is essentially um, where the power supply lives and where the computing lives. And it's basically been, been constructed underground in order to stop all of that machinery that's inside from leaking out and interfering with the telescope itself. So this photo is taken from basically the top of a man-made embankment, or a person-made embankment, I should say, where they'd excavated this giant hole in the ground and then built this kind of giant earth 
structure here. Someone's climbed to the top and taken this picture. Um, and this was another design choice I made, not only to build this building underground, but actually to be careful about where they dump the earth in order to provide an extra layer of shielding. You know, it's really been thought about to the nth degree. Um, I can give you a tour inside this. Uh, here's me lucky enough to visit, um, wondering, wondering how I managed to get here, but here I am. It's, uh, <coughs> there's like an entryway here, but you know, this isn't really a, this isn't really a single story even. These are kind of the top windows of, of what's buried underground. And you know, there's some serious kit in here. This is, a, this is the uninterruptible power supply. This is three 1.25 megavolt ampere uh, generators, um, about 10 to the eight joules. And what this thing basically does is that if the main supply conks out, this thing has a lot of rotary flywheels in it that ensure that there's an uninterrupted supply of electricity from basically a massive bank of batteries that are constantly kept charged. So basically, if there's a power cut, this entire telescope can just run off the batteries that are, that are, that are stored here. And um, these rotary flywheels allow this kind of uninterrupted flow of electricity. So you need power, of course, not only to keep the lights on and turn the dishes, uh, but also for the computing. Um, so this is also in that same building, just racks and racks and racks of HAL 9000 looking things that just sit there in the desert. Um, modern radio telescopes produce a frightening amount of data. So although some of the images I show you later on are probably no more than 200 megabytes, um, the data that goes into those 200 megabytes can actually be quite terrifying. Um, I'll give you some numbers. Uh, the correlator, which lives in this building and is basically a machine that looks like lots and lots of these. This is the machine that multiplies the signals together from pairs of dishes. So coming into the correlator off the dishes, off the digitizers on the dishes, uh, you're looking at about 2.2 terabits per second of data just going into that machine. Uh, out, out of the correlator, so this is getting written to disk, this is, uh, this, is the, this is now the product that astronomers like myself will pick up. Um, the correlator output when it's running full tilt is typically about 200 gigabits per second. So if I use Meerkat for eight hours and I'm using its full spectral resolution mode, um, my eight hour observation weighs in at something like 20 terabytes. So I already told you that some of the maps I show you are gonna be a couple of hundred megabytes. You know, it's data reduction for a reason. There's lots of averaging that can be going on. Uh, but often you wanna retain this kind of full, uh, full spectral resolution uh, products or these full, these full cream science products. Depending on the science goal you want to do, some of them rely on it, some of them don't. Um, and basically the, the computing hardware just for the post-correlator bit in the online system is something like 1.1 petaflops, which I think is about a thousandth of your brain. Anyway, onto the good stuff, uh, the pointy end of the telescope. If you fly in there now, you'll actually see something like this. Uh, it was really gratifying to see a picture like this after years of you know, CGI renderings of look at this amazing machine that we're gonna build. <laughs> and then someone shows you a photo like that and you're thinking, uh, and then someone says, no, it's actually real, it's there now. It's out there right now. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a good moment for anyone who's been waiting for this, for this project for, for many years like I have. <coughs> so here's a close up of the, of the core of the telescope. You can kind of see the density of antennas that this thing has. Uh, and you can see one of the antennas here. Um, this thing is about uh, 13 and a half meters from end to end with these offset Gregorian optics designs. So it has a primary reflector here, a subreflector here, and then a little carousel here that allows you to move different receivers in and out of the subreflector. Uh, and there are 64 of these things, so that's quite a lot of collecting area. And if you remember what I was saying before about interferometers, you want lots and lots of pairs to get lots and lots of information about the sky, to get lots and lots of really nice images. Um, these three receiver bands operate at basically these frequencies. This is the one that's currently installed and the one I'll be showing you results from this evening. Uh, and the antennas are spaced out like this in the desert. So about 70% of the collecting area is within this one kilometer circle. Uh, the maximum separation is about eight kilometers. So this one down to this one gives you the high resolution. You know, the widely separated ones show you the fine details. The closely packed ones show you the broad details. And this has lots and lots and lots of antennas. So you're really sampling the sky in radio waves with very, very good fidelity. <coughs> uh, it's also a very capable spectrograph. Um, it can give you 36, uh, 32,000 essentially independent frequency channels. So you can look at the sky and make an image, you get 32,000 of those images as a function of frequency over this range. Uh, and this is important for many astrophysical applications, some of which I'll, I'll come on to in a bit. Um, this is no longer true, sorry. Uh, but the, the point I want to make is that this is a very, very, very sensitive machine. These are somewhat esoteric units. This is meters squared per Kelvin per dish. Um, but basically the sensitivity of a radio telescope is given in meters squared, as in how, much, how big is my dish, how much light can I gather instantaneously at any one time. 
um, and Kelvin, which is a unit of temperature, which is how warm is my receiver. So the warmer your receiver is, the noisier your measurements are, and the longer you have to observe to beat down that noise. If your receivers are inherently cold, they're less noisy, and therefore you can observe the sky to a given depth faster. The really sweet thing about this, though, is it's a factor of 1.7 over spec. So someone said, OK, we're going to build this thing. And I was looking at it going, wow, that's going to be amazing. And then they said, we built this thing, and it's 1.7 times more sensitive than you were promised. It's like, wow, when does that ever happen? <coughs> For some comparison, um, I show this not to you know, disparage the VLA, which is a, an instrument I, I've used many times and continue to use and has many advantages over Meerkat in certain areas. Um, but this is kind of the technological advancement that I was talking about at the beginning, right, where you build better and better instrumentation and we do better and better things with it. So this is a, a VLA dish on the left, which is 25 meters across. Uh, there's a Meerkat dish on the right, yep, uh, about half the diameter. So even though this thing has, um, you know, four times the collecting area, each Meerkat dish is essentially as sensitive as one of these much larger VLA dishes because of these very good receivers. And bear in mind that the VLA has 27 of these and Meerkat has 64. So this is a, a phenomenally sensitive radio telescope. Um, it's probably the most sensitive radio telescope of its kind in the world. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's really nice to be in this position here. This slide's slightly dry, I apologize, but just to give you a quick project timeline, it has been a very long-term investment for South Africa. Um, so in 2003, South Africa entered the, the SKA project, uh, basically putting their hands up and saying, we'd like to be considered as a potential host nation. Um, <clears throat> work began on kind of making that a more attractive prospect quite quickly. The government legislated this radio quiet zone in the Karoo region. Uh, I think it's 1,500 square kilometers. I may be mistaken, it might be larger now. Um, and then in 2009, they started constructing small kind of smaller kind of engineering test beds to basically get into the interferometry game. 2010, so... Uh, Ten years ago now, the first call was put out to the international scientific community for, you know, we're building this telescope, what would you like to do with it? Um, and then design and construction uh, proceeded. Um, by 2016, things started moving very rapidly. Uh, in May 2016, we essentially had a four-dish prototype of, of that instrument consisting of four of the final dishes. And mere months later, we had the 16-dish first light image. Uh, the large survey projects were reviewed in 2017 because, obviously, the capabilities of the instrument had changed slightly. The scientific landscape had changed slightly because, you know, in seven years a lot of astrophysics happens. Is it still relevant? Um, the first 64 dish full array observations happened in April of 2018. Uh, and in June of 20, 2018, there was the official inauguration. So this has been a huge investment and a long term investment uh, for South Africa. Um, I believe it is Africa's largest scientific project. Um, and it's been, it's been a, a, a significant investment on, on the part of the government. Um, of course, one of, the, one of the reasons for South Africa to, to make this investment is a very important part of the project in my eyes, which is this, uh, the Human Capital Development Program. So I think in 2003, South Africa probably had five radio astronomers. Um, now the situation is, of course, very, difficult, uh, very different. Um, and one of the things that they do is every year they give out uh, bursaries for, for postgraduate uh, uh, um, students to do masters and PhD projects and for postdoctoral scholars to come and work on uh, scientific and engineering and computing related things directly connected to this project. The notion being that if your country is the host of a kind of iconic science project that you know, turns the eyes of the world onto it, then you can use that to incentivize kind of STEM research in your, in your country. And much as I love astrophysics, this has been a tremendously like, awesome part of the project, I think, in, in my opinion. It's been, a, it's been a huge success. Here's a photo from the bursary conference in uh, 2018. So in 2005, um, I need to get this right, so I've written a note for myself. In 2005, nine of these bursaries were given out. In 2017, there was over 103. Uh, and there have been over 1,100 of these postgraduate bursaries given out to date, funded by the South African government uh, through, the, through the Meerkat Telescope. And yeah, the, uh, the growth of the community and the, you know, the, the diversity increase in that community has been, has, been, uh, has been a tremendous success, in my opinion. <coughs> I mentioned the large survey project, so um, this is basically the copied out of a Word document or something. This is the ranked list of large survey projects that were assigned to the telescope based on the 2017 review. <coughs> so I just want to go through essentially a few of the headline things. Uh, I think these are in order of how they appear in this list. So one of the, one of the real headline science goal of this thing is, is pulsar timing. So pulsars are these rapidly rotating neutron stars that are left behind after a supernova explosion. Uh, highly magnetized objects frankly terrifying in my opinion, and they spin around really, really quickly, and then if the radio beam crosses Earth, you can see it as a tick. 
And by timing these things, uh, that you can you can really do some some kind of fundamental physics experiments in ways that you just cannot do in a laboratory on Earth. Um, these are the most accurate clocks in the universe. The you know the the applications for fundamental physics are are well known, and I think this is why that's kind of at the top of the list. But the other nice thing about the uh, you know the many antenna pairs that I keep going on about that Meerkat has um, this sensitivity to very diffuse things and very low surface brightness things allows this telescope to be a fantastically capable machine for imaging uh, imaging galaxies as they shine in their neutral hydrogen line. So this line is a natural frequency of, uh, of 1420 megahertz, 21 centimeters wavelength, um, and all the hydrogen in the universe basically just emits this. But it's very very faint, so you need a very sensitive telescope to detect it. And if you want to use this line as a probe of how galaxies are behaving in the distant universe, uh, then you really do need a very capable instrument to do that. This line is very, very faint. So Meerkat's sensitivity and imaging capabilities really make it a powerful machine for that. <coughs> so I'm involved in a couple of these projects, and I think that's where the rest of the talk will go, is some, some results from this, essentially. So the ones I'm involved in are this Galaxy Evolution one, uh, these neutral hydrogen in nearby galaxies ones, um, this accretion-powered and explosive phenomena one, this is uh, looking at things that you know, explode and then fade. Um, and then I'll finish up with basically one of the commissioning projects that I was lucky enough to be involved in, which was the imaging of the galactic center. <coughs> <coughs> so some, uh, some radio images, finally. Um, so this one, again, is probably better seen on the screens than the projector. Um, it's not the most mind-blowing image I'll show tonight, but it's actually quite personal to me, so I'll, I'll show it anyway. Uh, so this was the first image that I ever made with Meerkat operating with 60-odd dishes. Uh, and I like, this I like this image for, I think, maybe three reasons. So the first one is that, A, it's the first image I made with the telescope, and therefore it's very precious to me. Uh, the second one is that I had high expectations for this, and this actually kind of blew them away, and that's always nice. And the third thing is, it was kind of at this point that you realize the the potential of just building new instruments and their potential for discovering things that you hadn't even thought about when you asked people what they would do with it. Right, so I think one of the nice things about astronomy is that you, 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 know, you, you, you occasionally discover something in the universe that's not been seen before. And I think those kind of discoveries come with these kind of big leaps in instrumentation and with technological capability and with the, the processing improvements that computers have in order to keep up with these things. So this is an observation from the Thundercat project. Now Thundercat is this I'm not going to explain what the acronym is, they're all universally terrible. Thundercats, this is uh, a project to look at these kind of compact objects that flare and then fade again. So the scientific payload in this map, as far as Thundercat is concerned, is basically this thing, I think, one of these little dots in the middle. You know, they're looking for this thing going up and down and fading. But then this is uh, about an hour of observation to monitor this thing, and you get all of this other stuff for free because this instrument has a wide field of view and is very instantaneously sensitive. And if you look on the monitors, uh, have I got a pointer? The kind of, hmm, maybe I have one, maybe I don't. Doesn't reflect off the screen. All right, look around this thing. <laughs> so kind of doing this, I guess. You can see this big kind of, you know, figure eight dumbbell type structure, possibly an old supernova remnant of some kind. Probably no one's ever seen it before. It's, uh, it, it's, it's really nice and it, it really cements the kind of notion and, and the hope that you have when someone builds a new telescope that this thing is just gonna be a discovery machine, right? You just point it at space and you're gonna find weird and interesting stuff. And that's, that's a, a really nice thing to have, you know, given to you as the first image that you see, you know, the hint that that might actually be true. All of this other stuff as well, these are background galaxies that have supermassive black holes of their own that are shooting out jets of, of emission. Um, some nicer ones of those in a bit. <coughs> Slightly less impactful image, but uh, a movie to make up for it. <coughs> so here's another... Another nice example of, of the power of this telescope, I think. This is a weekly monitoring of an X-ray binary called GX339-4. So X-ray binaries are, as the name suggests, things that are bright in the X-rays, they're highly variable in the X-rays. And what these things are is a binary star system where you have um, a compact object, either a neutron star, possibly a black hole, uh, as well as kind of an evolved star companion. And these, these two things are in an orbit. And there is material being pulled off of the evolved star companion onto the compact object and every so often enough material, the mass is there, that one of these explosions happens and this thing flares. <coughs> so my colleagues in this project um, have been using Meerkat to monitor a handful of these things, but every week, so every week they just use 10 minutes of time, they go and they point it for 10 minutes, and then they go on to the next one. And I think they, they fill up about an hour of observing every week, but
but keep coming back to it every week. So what you're seeing here is a movie in time, um, which covers, I think, 76 weeks uh, between about April of 2018 and February of this year, so very fresh results. Um, 10 minute snapshot observations. And you couldn't really do this prior to Meerkat. And although this isn't the most spectacular image you'll see this evening, I think the power of it is clear in the sense that in just 10 minutes you can get an image of this quality. And you need that kind of snapshot imaging capability that comes with having a very capable imaging machine in order to get data that is you know, sensitive as this and images as well as this in, in such a short time. If you're wondering what that twinkling thing was in the corner, this is actually a known pulsar, one of those uh, rapidly rotating neutron stars I mentioned earlier. And this thing has kind of an on and an off mode that changes its brightness as you look at it in continuum. This isn't, this isn't twinkling because of individual pulses coming from it. It's twinkling because it's the level of its pulses varies. It's, it's either on or it's off. It changes its state. Um, this one was known, but uh, my colleagues have been looking at, at these data. Uh, you know, we're interested in this one, which is something we know about. Of course, the sensible thing to do is start investigating and monitoring all of the other sources in the field. Um, and you might find other new phenomena that you didn't know about just by virtue of being able to monitor this stuff. So um, there's been some papers out of the University of Manchester in the last uh, few months. Laura Dreesen, I think, has published one um, where she's discovered a, a, a mysterious radio emission from um, a known binary star in this field that uh, was spotted in these data because of its radio emission going up and down and, and has been investigated with, with other facilities to try to determine its nature. So again, the kind of serendipitous discovery potential of these things is is immense, I think. Um, it's just having the eyes and the computers and the people and the hours in order to actually exploit these data sets to the max. Moving to slightly larger scales, um, I think one of the bread and butter things of astronomy has always, of radio astronomy, I should say, has always been uh, the study of supermassive black holes. I think radio is, eh, I might get into an argument with an X-ray person, but I think personally radio is probably, arguably, the best tracer for black hole activity in the universe. Uh, what, what these things are is uh, these are active galactic nuclei, so these things are at quite significant distances now, way, way, way beyond our own galaxy. Um, you have an entire galaxy in this dot here, uh, and similarly on this side, and you have these two jets of material, uh, these synchrotron jets that are being launched by the central supermassive black hole, uh, which is in an active phase, and they inflate these giant cocoons of radio emission millions of light years away from the, from the host galaxy. And the physics of these things is also rich pickings. The, uh, these, these things are, are highly polarized, which is another thing you can do with a nice radio telescope. You can map the magnetic fields out in these things, um, try to map out the, the jet physics of what's going on. And then these weird tendril-like structures, you know, explaining the origin of these things is, is tricky enough. And then when you get images like this, which you know, reveal all the fine detail, it somehow becomes even more tricky. But it's, it, it's really, really awesome for me to see images like this coming off, coming off this telescope. So 3C40 is actually uh, a galaxy that lives in a cluster called Abel 194. Galaxy clusters themselves, again, going up in scale, these things are probably the largest gravitationally bound things you'll find. And if you look at these in optical, you, um, you see basically lots and lots and lots of galaxies. If you're lucky, you might see gravitational lensing going on. So this is the, the phenomena I showed earlier with the Einstein ring. Whole clusters of galaxies can lens background galaxies en masse because they're so massive. You see um, really beautiful distorted arcs. Um, but what you see in radio is these really kind of spooky, you know, diffuse structures that are associated with these. Um, these central, central blobs of radio emission, um, get this right, they're called, they're called halos. These blobs are called halos. This is essentially the hot gas that basically is being compressed inside the cluster as this massive pileup of, of many galaxies happens. These shine bright in the X-ray, they shine bright in the synchrotron, synchrotron light gas at millions and millions of degrees just shining right there in, in the clusters of these galaxies. And then also these, these weird sausage-shaped things at the periphery of these clusters. It's, again, gas that's being compressed, and that's probably compressing the magnetic field. And that's then allowing these things to shine in, in synchrotron light. But again, this, uh, these images are really quite, are really quite special, very new, very special. Um, I think it's going to be rich pickings for scientists for many years trying to, trying to get to the bottom of this. And again, and all this stuff that you just get for free, right? All of these dots in the background, these are all very distant galaxies that you see in the radio. <coughs> so here's a very hot off the press example of uh, this 32K channel mode I was talking about where you get an image for every frequency channel. Uh, and this is an example of the thing I mentioned where you're looking at the hydrogen line in the galaxy. Uh, I know it looks like a TV that's been tuned to a dead station, although probably not TVs that you get anymore. Um, 
but you can see in the middle bit here as we step through the movie in frequency these really you know ghostly wisps and this is showing the hydrogen gas moving at different speeds as we take a slice through a spiral galaxy here um, uh, the 32,000 channel mode on the telescope is quite new and as you saw from the data rates I was putting up at the beginning, quite terrifying. Um, the nice thing about this is this was testing out the kind of online processing that the science data processing team in Cape Town have been developing. So this thing basically processed this into 32,000 images that actually really look quite beautiful uh, in a little under twice the amount of time it took the observation. Um, if that doesn't mean much to you, it is very impressive. Again, you're getting stuff for free. There's another one up there. No one was really expecting to see that one. It's just a, an H1 disk that happened to be in the field of view and captured. <coughs> I want to give a quick plug for this as well, which is a, another nice thing, another nice initiative that's, um, that's been deployed in South Africa. So this is Mirlicht, which is Afrikaans for more light. Um, and this is basically a 0.6 meter optical telescope that at night is slave to wherever Meerkat's pointing. So all the time while Meerkat is observing, you get commensal optical images. The idea being that if something, uh, you know, a one-off event happens and you want to, you know, probe it in, in detail at other wavelengths, you've automatically got the optical follow-up without having to go back and apply for it at a time when whatever it is you're interested in might have gone. <coughs> So here's an image of uh, the, the Tarantula Nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And back to this issue of, or this notion that, you know, radio maps that I'm showing you tonight are, you know, if you're not, if you're not someone who looks at radio maps all day like me, then you might be looking at them thinking, ah, they're okay. Um, I, I always used to get annoyed when I'd see optical images like this because I was like, you know, look how stunning this is, you know, I picked the wrong wavelength. It's like, oh man. But I, I really don't think that's the case anymore. So here's what, here's what the Tarantula looks like with Meerkat. This image was made by uh, my friend and colleague, Oleg Smirnov. Um, this is the radio emission from the tarantula, so I think here to here is about uh, here to here, so it's more or less on the same scale. And you really do see all this like kind of cirrus, cirrus-like diffuse structure because of the excellent imaging capabilities of this machine. Um, for aficionados, if you'll notice the error pattern ar around this source. This source hasn't been... Uh, dealt with too well in the imaging process. This is actually Supernova 1987A. Um, this is at one, one Jansky. There's our friend Jansky again. This is very bright and it's slightly resolved. Um, but that aside, I think if you've seen radio maps in your time, you'll hopefully agree with me that, that this one is really quite something and that this telescope has clear potential and is, uh, is going to be game-changing for a lot of the science that we want to do with it. <coughs> okay. Um, so back to the center of our own galaxy. Uh, so the Meerkat observations of the galactic center. This was a, this was a commissioning project that I was lucky enough to be, to be involved with. Um, it was a good project to be involved with for many reasons, but also, you know, coming back to this thing, you know, me thinking that I picked the wrong wavelength because generally when I'm looking at a radio source, it looks like this. It's uh, the type of radio source I'm used to dealing with. And it is just a dot in a background. This is an actual image, by the way. It is just a dot in the background, but you mustn't lose sight of what this might represent, right? So this might contain actually 100 billion stars. Um, it might contain a 100 million solar mass supermassive black hole, and quite possibly it contains both. So, you know, when you look at a typical radio source in the sky, you know, a, a typical compact feature in the radio sky is not a star like a typical compact feature in the optical sky. A typical compact feature in the radio sky is actually a supermassive black hole at a very, very large distance outside our own galaxy. You see a very different sky in the radio. So, of course, Meerkat is a fantastically awesome machine if you're into dots, which I am. Um, this, is, this is an image I'm very proud of. This is, a, this is a deep observation of a field called Cosmos, which is one of these deep extragalactic survey fields. These are chosen to be away from our own galaxy so that we're not getting interference from you know, big bright things in our own galaxy. These are fields that are generally away from bright foreground stars so that our friends who work at optical observatories can get the optical data for us. And we go very deep on quite narrow fields in order to look to the very distant universe. So each of these dots in this, in this picture is actually a galaxy at some very large distance. The bright ones, like I said, are probably supermassive black holes, uh, representing, sorry, active supermassive black holes. The fainter ones are probably um, things more like our own Milky Way, so just regular run-of-the-mill star-forming galaxies, the type of galaxy that there is the most of in the universe. Um, and using Meerkat, this is the galaxy evolution side of things that you can do with this. You can actually start to detect large numbers 
uh, of these regular star forming galaxies as a function of their distance in the universe to start asking the question, you know, how did things like the Milky Way form? You know, how did things like Andromeda form? What were the progenitors of the galaxies that were just happily forming stars, you know, a few billion years ago without really bothering anyone? Uh, we now have the, uh, the radio instrumentation to start addressing some of these questions in a, in a statistical way with, with large samples. Um, but to put it into context, if each of those dots has a median redshift of one, a cosmological redshift of one, uh, you're looking back in time at about uh, a look back time of about eight billion years. Um, so when that light set out on the journey that I just showed you in that map, you know, we were still three and a half billion years away from having a planet. So, you know, that light sets off on its journey and then, you know, you've had time for the Earth to form, humans to evolve, build a radio telescope, capture that light and you've still got three and a half billion years of change. It's, you know, it's... <laughs> so I, I put this into context at this point when I talk about the galactic centre because as you saw from that wonderful movie with the variable stars, the galactic centre is only 26,000 light years away. And this is nothing compared to this, right? So in what I just said about the formation of the Earth, you can actually look at what humans were doing 26,000 light years away, uh, 26,000 years ago, I should say. You know, when the galactic centre light set out on its journey, humans were in the Stone Age. Um, this wonderful artefact here was uh, uncovered, about 20, uh, uncovered in an uh, archaeological dig in the Czech Republic. This is Venus 15. This is a, a mammoth ivory carving, which is, I think, believed to represent the earliest known example of, uh, of humans carving portraits. So this is, this is supposedly a representation of an actual person and uh, not just like a religious idol figure. Um, possibly this person was, you know, identified of being worthy of a carving because of the, the unusual asymmetries in her face. But this is, you know, 26,000 years ago when the galactic center light first beams off in our direction. Humans were very busy doing wonderful things like this, let alone being three and a half billion years away from actually having a planet. In cosmic terms, the galactic center is very, very close. And that proximity is very useful because with the right instrument, and I hope I've convinced you up until now that what we are talking about tonight is a very good instrument, you can actually start to have a good look at the processes that are going on at the hearts of all of those other dots. Right? So every single massive galaxy is, is thought to host a supermassive black hole. Every single galaxy that we can think of is definitely forming stars. What is the interplay between those two processes? You know, the galactic center is a very interesting, a very interesting place compared to you know, the relative peace and tranquility of our, of our own galactic neighborhood. That's probably for the best, otherwise we probably wouldn't be here. But you know, cramming all of this wonderful stuff into kind of one pixel, you know, I mean, it's what I do, but it's nice to have a good look at this stuff close up sometimes. Um, anyway, here's the, uh, here's the inaugural Meerkat Galactic Center image. So this was the result of the commissioning program. Uh, basically, I kind of liken this to sea trials, right? Like someone's built a boat and you want to make sure that it's seaworthy, so you, you take it out and sail it around the bay a bit. And if it doesn't take on water, then <coughs> all's good. Uh, if it leaks a bit, bring it back, fix it up. But it's the same with telescopes, right? You, you, you build them and the easiest way to test whether it's actually behaving itself is not to plug in a voltmeter, it's just point it at the sky and then you know, get some astronomers to say if that's right or wrong. Um, and it, it, it's a, actually a hope you can see the contrast between this image and the, the kind of previous state-of-the-art images that, that I've showed you this evening. Long story short, the telescope behaves very, very, very well. <coughs> <coughs> so this got a, it got a bit of air time, which was nice. Um, I single this one out because I really like I really like this headline, this headline summary: "Stunning Chaos in the in the Galactic Center." I think "Stunning Chaos" is a, a wonderful way to describe it. I actually don't like the way this guy's blog, blog is called "Bad Astronomy." <laughs> I, I dis disagree with the title. Um, and you basically know your time has come when someone makes a giant banner out of one of your one of your <laughs> afternoon's work. So uh, this banner actually turned out to be of a tourist attraction for some celebrities. So. Here we have uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, president of South Africa, along with uh, Xi Jinping, who's the president of China. So China, as you may have heard, have just deployed their own very large telescope. It's a, a single disk telescope called FAST, which has a, a diameter of 500 meters, which is frankly mind boggling. Um, I, like to, I like to speculate that what these two chaps were talking about at this point was, you know, whose giant radio telescope was the best. <laughs> um, and I'm hoping from the expressions that there was a clear winner. <laughs> But you know, apart from being a, you know, an opportune thing to have a selfie taken against for very influential world leaders, I think, again, with these data, there are scientific rich pickings 
that have really not been there until now. Like the, I think you could spend, as, a, as an astronomer or even as a curious person, just go sightseeing in this image and you'll find things that people have never seen before and you'll find things that are going to make people scratch their heads when people go and actually chase these things up. So I'd like to give you a little tour around the image and in particular some of the regions of the periphery that weren't actually in the PR image. So stuff that you can't actually see in this image but is, is interesting nonetheless. Um, like I said, there's a lot in here and one of the nice things about this image is you can use it to illustrate the fact that in the universe black holes really are everywhere and black holes have many different sizes. Um, so down here there's a one of these background radio galaxies. This might have a, a supermassive black hole of about 100 million solar masses. Jumping to the right, on the smaller end of the black hole scale, you have um, the outrageously named Great Annihilator. <laughs> this is another one of these binary star systems, probably hosting a compact object that has a few solar masses. And what you can see here are this thing producing radio jets from, from the compact uh, object in the same way that these, or possibly the same way that these you know, much larger black holes do. And then again, you can see a zoom of the Sagittarius A star region of this. So this is taken from this region that's saturated in this image, but kind of desaturated a bit. So you can again see the detail, the compact uh, object here, signposting the location of the 4 million solar mass black hole that, that lives in our own galaxy. <coughs> so here's the meerkat view of the mouse, which I mentioned but didn't describe in, the, uh, in what I thought was... Uh, you know, one of, my, one of my own personal favorite radio images of, of all time, which is the VLA 330 megahertz one. And the mouse is a really cute story, actually. So here's a, this shell here, which is a, a supernova remnant. So this is what's left after a very massive star has ended its life and decided to go out kicking and screaming. You know, colossal explosion happens. The outer material from the star gets ejected and inflates these giant bubbles. And as I mentioned, pulsars, which are these rapidly spinning neutron stars, are often the end product of the lives of these very massive stars. So the core collapses into this compact object, a pulsar or a neutron star. The outer layers of the star blow off and inflate this bubble. And this picture here tells a really nice story because when this explosion happens, it doesn't just happen and everything stays where it is. You know, it's incredibly violent. It might start on one side and then propagate around to the other. But what often happens is that the compact object gets kicked out of the system. And that's exactly what's happened here, right? So you've got this shell from the supernova remnant over here. And then you have this thing pinging out at high speed. And if you point a radio telescope in timing mode at the tip of this thing, you find there's actually a pulsar. So there's kind of, you know, a death and rebirth thing going on here. The star's ended its life and left this shell. And what's left of it's, you know, boosting off in that direction to find a new home. But I think the imaging quality here is, is, is really nice. You know, you can, you, well, on the monitors again, you can see this really quite nice cirrus-like structure that's not really been seen before in, in such nice detail. Um, and again, to the top right, you can see this long linear feature. This is one of these, one of these filaments. Meerkats are actually offered as a view of these filaments like, like no other instrument. Um, I should point out that one of the advantages of Meerkat being in South Africa is that the galactic center is at southern declinations. You can observe the galactic center basically all day from South Africa, whereas if you're in the northern hemisphere, you don't have that luxury. And if you remember that you use the rotation of the Earth to build up the, the kind of the spatial scale coverage that your instrument has when you're using an interferometer, if you can observe it for longer, you can build up more of that spatial coverage, you can get higher fidelity images. So these observations of the galactic center, particularly in revealing some of these filaments, um, have been, I think, will prove to be an actual gold mine. So here's a slightly closer view, and you can see these, again, these long linear features. Often these are multiple complexes of parallel features. You can see some very faint ones down here that have probably never seen before. Uh, these things looking like harps. Some more examples here. You've got, again, these kind of parallel harp-like features. Um, odd crisscrossy ones here. Uh, little compact feature here in the middle of this thing. Um, some people believe that these things are illuminated by the injection of these relativistic particles that make the magnetic field shine in synchrotron light. Um, there must be a kind of progenitor object that, um, that causes that particle injection. Um, I have a different take on it, which is something I'll end the talk with, uh, but we can get to that shortly. Again, here's a view to the south of the galactic plane. Um, this is the supernova shell that the mouse is ejected from now. Here's that filament that I pointed out before. These like very faint, long, linear features suggestive of outflows coming out from the, from the center of the galaxy, away from the galactic plane. Here's our background radio galaxy with a very large black hole in it. And again, these filaments are just everywhere. <coughs> so to give you a comparison of, of the kind of views that we're getting of this region of space in terms of um, the kind of wider field of view imaging, that's a, uh, this is a VLA and Green Bank Telescope uh, kind of multiple pointing map of the region. Here's the Sagittarius A star complex. 
Um, here's a big filament structure running across here. This thing's called the super bubble. Uh, they call it the super bubble because it's unborn and dying. In fact, if you look at the center of this super bubble uh, in optical, you'll find um, two and possibly even three of the most very massive clusters of stars that we know about, the arches, the quintuplets, I forget the others. Um, but then the sort of views we're getting with it now, uh, you can see that the super bubble is you know, very nicely imaged in terms of its, its, the structure of its walls. Uh, these filament structures, again, um, very well resolved into you know, complexes of many, many parallel fil filaments and then kind of just fading like hair into, into either you know, intrinsically fading or just fading below the detectability. But it's nice to do this, right? This is, again, it hasn't always been this way, you know, and I'm not throwing shade on any of these previous observations, but I think this instrument is, is really something else. And, uh, you know, I think it's really going to produce a lot, of, a lot of groundbreaking science during the time that it operates, and it's a, it's a great success story for, for South Africa. <coughs> One of the nice things that you see on this map is, again, uh, on the screens probably see them better. So we have these massive star clusters in here and the, 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 the super bubbles are thought to have been inflated by the, by the deaths of many of these stars over the generations and the generations. And with Meerkat for the first time, we see in the heart of the super bubble, very low angular extent supernova shells. So these are probably very young supernova remnants. Um, possibly the, the um, uh, very recent, recently uh, exploded stars. This is the kind of thing that Merlin does in, in, in nearby galaxies. It looks into the heart of very nearby galaxies with this extremely high angular resolution and, and maps out these tiny supernova shells. And uh, because of the proximity of this and the quality of these images, we can start to detect many now young supernova remnants in and around the, <coughs> the Sagittarius A star complex. Um, yeah, so I think the the expectation or the hope, I suppose, that, that I had that this telescope would actually be a discovery machine <laughs> Um, you know, may actually come true. Um, moving from the very small scale features in these data to the very large, I think further proof of that hope um, came when we made a very wide image of the, of the data from the, um, the commissioning campaign to observe the Galactic Center. Um, and that actually revealed a very large radio structure that had never been seen before. So this is, uh, this is the galactic plane here. And back to the uh, galactic coordinates view now. Here's the Sagittarius A star complex. Here's the filaments uh, over the super bubble and a few more of the other filaments. Here's the mouse. All these things you now know and love, I'm sure. Uh, this thing's actually a foreground um, star forming region, I think, kind of in the way, which is annoying, but we don't get any say in that. Um, but yeah, this, uh, this kind of really popped out and was a very pleasant surprise. So you can see that there's like a coherent bubble-like structure above and below the plane of the Milky Way here. Um, completely dwarfing any other large radio scale, any large scale radio structure uh, in, in or around this region. Um, <coughs> so this thing's basically about 1,400 light years end to end. And I think uh, what this thing points to essentially is the, the supermassive black hole in the middle of our galaxy being a bit of a messy eater. So we've had these things at the start of the talk where it kind of flares for a bit, you know, some material falls in and Sagittarius A star rebrightens and then fades. But what this points to is you know, the scale of this thing and the energetics involved uh, point to an event in the center of our galaxy a few million years ago that was on a much larger scale. So we're talking, you know, maybe uh, 10, 100,000 solar masses of, of gas passing too close to Sagittarius A star, perhaps. Um, some of it falling in, some of it hitting the accretion disk, maybe a burst of star formation happening, and a cumulative kind of effect of, you know, this sudden injection of material is a sudden outflow of energy. And the notion is that that event is what's kind of inflating these bubbles. <coughs> so, I mean, it kind of begs the question, how often does this happen, right? This was only 7 million years ago. You know, it's not that long ago, really, in terms of things of this scale and of these energies and, the, you know, the size of our own galaxy. Um, so it'd be interesting to see, you know, with, with this telescope or with future instrumentation, you know, maybe there's evidence for these things above and below the plane that we, we, haven't, we haven't seen before. And it's kind of a fossil record of kind of the dining habits of the black hole at the, at the center of our own galaxy. You can kind of use these things to infer, you know, the, the history of what's gone on in the, in the center of our galaxy, how the material falls in, how it comes back out again, what that interplay is between a supermassive black hole and the gas supply of the galaxy that it lives in. The total energy output, I think, back of the envelope-ish is about the total energy output that the sun will provide, but over its entire lifetime. So this is a, a pretty punchy event. 
the thing I like most about this, um, I think this is the final, final part of my talk now, um, is this relationship or potential relationship that it has with these magnetized filaments. So basically, if you plot the locations of these magnetized filaments, you'll notice that not only are they mostly aligned north-south with these radio bubbles, but most of them happen to live within the cavities of these bubbles. So it's nice to be able to consider the notion that these things that have been a mystery for, for, for you know, 35 years since their discovery could actually be connected to a, you know, their, their origin could lie in a single explosive event that happened in the center of our galaxy. And that lets you say that what you're looking at here potentially is that the, the magnetic field of the galaxy is, is sitting in situ, and the event that caused the outflow and the inflation of these bubbles is also the source of the very high energy particles that was kind of injected on mass as a one-off event that then illuminated all of these filaments. Something else very mysterious or, you know, circumstantial, I'm not a lawyer, um, the longest of these filament complexes by far are pretty much precisely coincident with the boundaries of these bubbles. <coughs> I think that's what I just said. So the, uh, the kind of spatial density of these bubbles, you know, how many, are, how many of them are there are per kind of, you know, unit height in this structure. Um, it, declines, uh, it declines as you move towards the tips of the bubbles. And if you actually look at the density of cosmic rays, which are just essentially you know, charged particles moving at, at relativistic speeds close to the speed of light, you notice a similar kind of latitudinal decline in cosmic ray energy density. So I think this, this bubble structure is, is some kind of smoking gun from this kind of past messy dining experience that our own galaxies had, but actually might be the progenitor event that has caused all of these filaments, uh, filaments to light up. It was the event that has created this very large, po very large population of very fast moving particles that's then binding to the magnetic field of the galaxy along these two channels and uh, giving rise to these filamentary structures. It's going to be interesting to uh, see how this plays out, I think, with, with more observations and you know, hopefully some theorists will get involved because I'm out of my depth at that point. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, so uh, rich pickings in these data, I think. Uh, this is just showing you two of these newly discovered filaments that are actually about 1.75 degrees away from, from Sagittarius A star. So again, it's going to be interesting to do observations at higher galactic latitudes moving further out, see if we can see evidence of previous events where uh, material has been ejected by explosive events at the center of our own galaxy and, you know, kind of try and back out the history of, of, what, of what's gone on inside our own galaxy as a, as a result of these new observations. Um, I think I'm done. I thank you so much for your attention. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, I don't know, I was trying to think of a comparison between how we're old. It's like going from scratchy black and white TV in the corner of the room to some, you know, 4K TV set. They are absolutely stunning uh, images. And I must say, when we all saw, like, that galactic centre image appear on our... The, the people who didn't have privileged access to the, to the images that you would have had beforehand, it was a, a remarkable uh, sight to see. So, it's been very frustrating not being able to shout about it from the moment I saw it, to be honest. Yeah, there's a lot of things that hap have to happen secretly before they're ready to be released. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's brilliant stuff. So has anybody got any questions they'd like to ask uh, uh, Ian about uh, any of this work about the telescopes and the data? Sorry. Yeah, you, you said uh, Meerkat is a sort of precursor to the SKA. How, what's the expected life of Meerkat then before SKA supersedes it? Good question. I'd hope it has at least five years in it. Um, who really knows? I think uh, the timeline for SKA kind of... The nice thing about interferometers is that you can use them before they're finished. <coughs> you know, you can build a few dishes and, and, do, uh, and do science with those. And I think around 2024, I think the first SKA dish is a are kind of expected to start kind of operating in that mode. The MICA itself won't be replaced by the SKA. It will actually form about 25% of the dishes that are part of SKA mid, so it will eventually be absorbed by it. I mean, what I'd like to see is, uh, you know, MICA given a chance to shine. Um, I think if SKA can come along and, you know, start to enhance the capabilities of, you know, the, the, the instruments on the ground in the crew that are doing radio astronomy, then that would be very welcome. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. Does anyone have a more accurate timeline for VSK than me? Uh, Guess not. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Ian, yeah. Uh, question on the string things, or the you know, sort of the bubble fronts. Yeah. Are those things which have passed us by now, or are we sort of waiting to anticipate the the front coming through, as if you will? Uh, th these these filaments. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I don't think. I mean, the even if they were moving at the speed of light towards us, it would be twenty six thousand years before they got here. But I'd, um, the 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 gas in this area is not actually moving that fast. Uh, I think the velocity dispersion measurements are. I don't know, tens of kilometers per second at the base of this thing, up to kind of hundreds, hundreds of kilometers per second. But the material's all kind of being entrained away from the, the center of the galaxy. Um, I think one of the reasons you see this kind of north-south extent of these bubbles is simply because it's easier for stuff to escape that way, right? Like the plane of the galaxy, the disk of the galaxy, stuff moving through it meets more opposition. It's easier for something that just oh explodes yeah. to come out like this. Yeah. So I don't think anything's heading right for us, but um, I don't know. If you hear otherwise, let me know, I guess. <laughs> Um, on one of your photographs when you were showing the uh, uh, construction mm. and the layout of the uh, map, the centre region of the Meerkat seemed to be laid out with, uh, uh, in with spiral arms like the, uh, the galaxy. Is that some sort of homage or is it just accidental that it appeared to have? Excellent uh, question. This one? Yeah, yeah that one. Yeah. yeah, so these are, well, there's a, there's a version number here. I don't know exactly how how current this is, but um, you don't you don't see Meerkat at all on this map. You just see the kind of, you know, the very, you know, it's it's an eight kilometer diameter thing in the middle here. These these antennas are or these dots are laid out with the kind of proposed positions of the eventual SKA antenna layout. But the spiral arm is not a coincidence. So um, when you're designing an array of radio telescopes, you want to kind of maximize the range of spatial scales that you're sampling. And it turns out that a spiral arm is a a good way to do that and be quite a cost-effective way to do that because if you're building a very long kind of hundreds of kilometer long you know piece of infrastructure that does this then you can just run power and data and roads along along the line like that um, and it's kind of I guess it's kind of a compromise by having a truly optimized random um, layout or a truly optimized layout or a random layout you kind of impose this kind of structure as an optimal way to get good imaging quality but also as a way to circumvent kind of geographical constraints and probably more importantly cost um, but it's a good question. Uh, the, the layout of these telescopes is generally given careful consideration in order to, um, if not optimize for a science case, at least trade off between the various science cases that you would like to do with the machine. Very quickly, who picks the colors for the photos? You got red, green, blue, grey. Uh, <laughs> these ones. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's another good question because the the colour choice is completely arbitrary, right? Because what this represents is radio light, which of course is a colour we can't see. Um, so essentially, it comes down to. Uh, well, I think if you're doing a paper, the primary driver should be kind of the scientific usefulness of the choice of colours. If you're doing a PR image, then I guess aesthetics is a consideration. <laughs> um, but you don't want to pick a completely wacky color scale that you know doesn't mean much. Oftentimes, people they, they just color it like the rainbow, and it's it's a really awful color choice, frankly, because it's not perceptually uniform. Like your eye perceives yellow as much brighter than red, and yet red is the brightest region than the yellow one. So it, I think it's something that definitely warrants careful consideration. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, most of these choices were, were mine. Um, I'm sorry if they were bad ones. <laughs> Um, the filaments that you've shown, um, as I understand it, you're saying that uh, they are as a result of synchrotron radiation of electrons going around a magnetic field. Is that right? Yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, our normal experience to normal people is that you have a magnetic field and it's attached at both ends. 
right. but you seem to have free flying um, magnetic fields. How does that happen? I would, I would guess that what you're seeing here is a section of a larger scale magnetic field structure that the galaxy has. So like a toroidal magnetic field that might loop around like a bar magnet. And because you have, you have particle injection that isn't along the entirety of these things, so particle injection, even if it is caused by this kind of single explosive event, compared to the global magnetic field of the galaxy, is probably still quite localized. So it's probably only illuminating a section of the magnetic field. I imagine these things do close. The other issue is that the magnetic field here is probably quite complex. Um, it's probably being affected by you know, the movement of the, the magnetized material so due to the motion of these outflows and things and supernovas compressing it. Um, so I imagine it's, it's, probably, it's, it's probably looking a little weird for, for, for a combination of those two, region, of those two reasons. Um, anyone who's got a, an answer to that other than my own is welcome to chip in. But I, I don't think it's, I, th I think that's probably what's going on. Right, thanks. Like the, the simplistic view is kind of a closed magnetic field, but we're only seeing a bit of it, and actually it's a lot more messy than we'd like it to be. <laughs> yeah. Hi, yes, uh, here. Hi. So um, is there any influence of dark matter that you can measure with these observations? Uh, so one of the earliest um, indicators for the presence of dark matter was, I think, observations of this 21 centimeter hydrogen line. Um, so looking looking at the looking at how galaxies rotate and comparing that to you know the the material that you can see in the starlight versus how fast the the galaxy is actually rotating, kind of infers that there's more material in the in the galaxy that you can see. The shape of these rotation curves that that flatten off is a, an indicator that there's hidden material that we're not picking up. Um, in terms of whether you can use radio to directly detect dark matter, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm not sure if you're thinking of processes that dark matter might be involved in that would give rise to radio light. Um, I'm not too sure about that, to be honest. Again, anyone who else has a, a comment on that, please feel free to chip in. Yeah, you're saying the, the dishes work in pairs and the further apart they are, the higher the resolution. Mm. What's the limit to that? Could they be consonants apart so that the yeah mm. no that in fact so that's you get absolutely fantastic resolution from in, indeed they uh, they they can be a consonant apart and you know that's actually a a fairly routine way of doing radio interferometry at very high resolution. So if you give me a second to find the the VLBI image that I showed, this this image here probably uh, will have been made with telescopes in you know covering the entire surface of the Earth. And you kind of keep recording as one sets, you know, <laughs> as, as one sets, and you're not looking at the target anymore. You, you're going to lose baselines to that antenna, but this might feature baselines between the United States, Europe, uh, China. You will have seen undoubtedly the Event Horizon Telescope image, uh, the first image, the first direct image of a black hole. That was made with an interferometer as well. And the reason that um, they managed to get such extreme angular resolution in that case was because they went from the sort of frequencies we're looking at here, which are one to two gigahertz, up to what was it, 300, 200 gigahertz. I forget, there's a factor of 100 increase in frequency, which gives you a factor of 100 increase in resolution. And again, that was a global VLBI network. It had telescopes in the South Pole. It had telescopes in Chile. Um, where else? Greenland, maybe. It's yeah, so if that kind of resolution was focused on the areas, on the galactic center, what kind of images would you get from that? Yeah, so I imagine what you would get is a very high resolution image of Sagittarius A star itself. So. With this extremely high angular resolution comes a limitation in that you've got, um, you can't build an array of telescopes that spans the entire globe that has lots of receptors. It's, it's just impractical. So what you end up with is you have maybe up, up to 10, let's say, uh, isolated dishes that you combine the signals from and not many dishes in between. So you have excellent sensitivity to very compact things at very high angular resolution, but you have extremely limited sensitivity to things on scales in between, you know, the smaller scale stuff, or sorry, the larger scale stuff that is seen by your shorter spacings. Those shorter spacings fundamentally aren't present in an array like that, so it's just, it's just a limitation of the technique. Um, the Event Horizon Telescope's observing campaign is moving on to Sagittarius A star now. Um, it's a little trickier because Sagittarius A star varies 
over the kind of times that they'll be doing the observation, and that makes interferometry very difficult. If the sky is static, um, life's a lot easier. But I think there'll be some results coming out from that soon where they've trained the Event Horizon Telescope on Sagittarius A star in an attempt to, to see the, uh, the, uh, the photon ring around our own, our own supermassive black hole. I'm getting away with getting not as many questions as Naomi, so <laughs> I'm relaxing over here. Um, with the filament things, have they been spotted in other galaxies yet? Because I think you said they were caused by black holes and the way they like consume matter. Yep, that's uh, the answer is no. Uh, that is a fantastic question. Um, there is no reason to think that they are unique to our own galaxy. Like, why would they be? Um, if you have a supermassive black hole that's burping and you have a magnetized galaxy that it's doing that into, then particles are fundamentally going to get attached to the magnetic field of that galaxy, assuming that's the origin, which is my personal favorite. So there is absolutely no reason why you wouldn't be able to see these things in a nearby galaxy. Um, the only limitation there is instrumentation. So, you know, like I said, our own galaxy, the proximity of the center of our own galaxy lets us have a really good look in a way that we can't do with external galaxies. But you know, one day I'm sure we'll have the instrumentation to do such observations and I'll make sure you get, get the credit when they get found. <laughs> you say that the greater the uh, distance between the antenna, the greater the detail you get. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason why you couldn't have one antenna on the moon and the other one on Earth? None whatsoever. There wouldn't be a delay in the signal that would confuse the image then? So, the, I mean, there's, there's fundamentally a delay between, you know, the arrival time of the wave at one telescope and then the other. Yeah. And that's what we have to compensate for when we do this, this technique of interferometry. So as long as you know accurately where your telescope on the moon is, and I think if you were going to go to the expense of putting one there, you should make sure you do, <laughs> then there's no reason why you couldn't add the signal from that telescope up in phase with one on the Earth. In fact, space VLBI already happens. There's a, there's a Russian telescope called Radio Astron, which goes out some appreciable fraction of the distance to the moon already. And that's just a radio antenna that's in a, in a very, very long, very eccentric orbit. And that thing's used, again, to study um, the cores of distant galaxies at extremely high angular resolution. So there is no reason other than we need someone to write us the check, really. Yeah. The, um, the work you've done on the galactic core... Sorry. Um, oh, hi. Sorry. Hi. Um, has, there any been, has there been any collaboration between the work you've done and the Murchison Array? Is there uh, any, because they're operating obviously at a different frequency. Yeah, um, so the, uh, the Murchison Wide Field Array is a, is a low frequency radio telescope operating at kind of 80 to about 250 megahertz, I think, uh, in Western Australia, which is the other side of the square kilometer array. Um, it's slightly different technology from big steerable dishes. It's just uh, arrays of antennas that lay out on the ground and, and is steered electronically. Um, and this thing has also been observing you know, for a while now as a precursor instrument to the SKA. Um, so the MWA has produced images of the entire sky basically at this point. The limitation is with the current MWA data, in, in my opinion, is that because of the low frequency you have correspondingly lower angular resolution and also because the array is smaller you have correspondingly lower angular resolution. So there are all sky images including the galactic plane and indeed the center of our own galaxy um, but the angular resolution doesn't really compare to what we see here. Um, in terms of, compa of comparing the, the kind of close-in environment, filaments, et cetera, around Sagittarius A star. Um, what it probably will be useful for, I think, is, uh, is, is studies of the bubbles, um, kind of more extended, extended structures on, on that level, and I guess some results will be pending at some point soon, but I'm, I'm not party to them. We've got one last question. Hi, could I ask if the, um, the filaments, um, the bubble that are you know, coming out of our galactic centre you've discovered, have got any relation to the cosmic event that may have warped our galactic structure that you mentioned at the very beginning? Uh, or are we talking different timescales for the two? Pro pro perhaps different, well, probably different timescales, but I think certainly different, different actual physical scales. So the, the warping of the disk has probably happened due to interactions over, over billions of years with our with our neighbors, our galactic neighbors in the group. So you know there's the large and the small Magellanic clouds, the, the kind of smaller satellite galaxies. I imagine that the warping of the Milky Way disk has happened as a result of you know, nearby interactions and, and near misses with, with those and other more massive systems. Mm. Um, I don't think something going bang in the center of our own galaxy could cause a disk to warp like that. 
um, the kind of sphere of influence of the black hole and the processes that, that happen, you know, with the exception of it driving very large scale jets into the intergalactic medium, um, it doesn't really have that much of an effect on the galaxy it lives in. It's, it's, it's much more confined to the center. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it could walk the disk like that. Thank yeah. you. Hmm. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Um, th shall we thank Ian again for a really uh, superb talk? <laughs> <laughs>